this is the Advent season, and it's a word taken from the Latin, which is Adventus, which means coming, and it celebrates the coming of Jesus here on earth as a baby. And Christmas is one of my favorite times of year. And Jesus, when he came, he actually came to usher in a new season, a new day, a new age. And many people understand that to be away from the old covenant into the new covenant. And in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came, it ushered in the age of the church and started the last days in Joel 2. Uh, the prophecy in Joel 2, in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And so Jesus, when he came, he had this encounter with a woman at a well in Samaria in John chapter 4. And it's a fascinating story, but he talks specifically to her about this new day, this new time, this new age. And he declares to her, a time has coming and has now come. It's right here. And what is this time? It is the time when the Father desires worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. And so he was making this declaration, this demarcation that at this moment, in this hour, on this day, at this time, something is going to shift from how people have understood worship with God, worship to God, uh, into something different. And he says, the Father desires worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth, who will worship in spirit and in truth. And I understood this always to mean the Holy Spirit, which, again, he poured out in at Pentecost and, and Acts 2, so that believers are now filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the truth is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when they believe uh, and in Jesus and confess with their mouth that he is Lord, that uh, they become saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and now they can now worship the Father, uh, you know, in the Holy Spirit and in the truth of Jesus Christ. But God was also teaching me that we also have to understand this uh, declaration from the context that we was in in John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, Jesus travels to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and he's at a well, which is actually Jacob's well from the Old Testament. And he meets the Samaritan woman and has a conversation with her. And eventually, she discovers, uh, realizes he's a prophet of the Lord. And he doesn't rec recognize that he's actually the prophet, the Holy One sent by God as his son, the Messiah. And <clears throat> she says this statement. She says, you Jews believe that you should worship in Jerusalem. And they had a temple in Jerusalem, and people would come and bring their offering and sacrifices to that temple. And they said, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. And the Bible is not clear on what that mountain is, but historically, uh, it has been identified as Mount Gerizim. And in the past, the Samaritans actually built a temple on that mountain. And many people had, haven't learned this in the church, but uh, so in the past, Samaritans would worship at this mountain. And uh, part of the reason why this was established and the Samaritans did not have a great relationship with the Jews is because there was a command by the Lord not to intermarry with foreigners, but yet uh, some of the Jews actually did intermarry and, and they formed their own temple and they began to worship there uh, separate from where the original temple was Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And, and so eventually, one of the high priests of Israel, John Hyrcanus, he rallied people to destroy the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. And so that's part of the reason why there's such animosity between these two people groups. But yet at the time of the Samaritan woman, uh, people in that region would still go to that mountain and worship God on the remains of that temple. And so that's kind of some context to this idea of you believe, the Jews believe that you should worship in Jerusalem. Our ancestors believe we should worship here. And this is where Jesus responds, uh, believe me, woman, a time is coming and has now come. And basically what he's saying is that the Father doesn't really uh, desire people to worship at a specific 
earthly location is that it doesn't matter if you go to Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, but he desires people who will worship in spirit. And so this whole parable, this whole encounter, this story, it's not a parable, it's a whole story, this encounter is about location. It gives specific details about where he is in Sychar, in Samaria, at Jacob's well. And he's talking about the Mount Gerizim and Jerusalem and the temple there. And Jesus is saying, it's not about earthly locations a time is coming now has come when the father desires worshipers who will worship in the spirit realm the realm of the spirit <laughs> why because the temple is no longer here on earth uh, solomon's temple the samaritan temple there's no temple that people can go to that says this is the this is the temple of the lord why because Jesus ushered in a new season, a new age, a new time, where he is inviting people into the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple. And this is in Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews, where he said that the earthly tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle back in Exodus, was just a copy and a shadow of the heavenly one. And so what are copies and shadows? They are meant to point us to the original. And uh, this Jesus was saying that people have worshipped in a copy and a shadow for generations, but now a time is coming when he is inviting people to learn how to worship the Father in the true tabernacle, the, in the realm of the Spirit. And in truth, it's only through Christ that we can enter into this tabernacle because he is our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. And one example of uh, how this is played out through in, in Jewish history is that it goes all the way back to Exodus when God frees the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. And the reason why he wanted them to be freed is so that they could go and serve and worship him in the wilderness, in the desert. And so in Exodus 19, he even tells Moses uh, and the Israelites, uh, if you keep my covenant, and obey my commands, you will be for me a special people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. And he tells Moses to prepare the Israelites to meet with him at a mountain. And uh, <clears throat> on the day that this happens, uh, God doesn't come like he did with Elijah in the still small voice and the gentle whisper. He actually comes with fire, with lightning and thunder and a dark cloud, and it was shaking. It was actually a, a fairly frightful sight to be there. And people were actually scared, and they could hear the voice of God coming from the cloud on the mountain. And they got scared, and they said, uh, you talk to God. They asked Moses, you talk to God and tell him, what, uh, ask him what he wants us to do, and we'll just listen to that. And Moses tries to encourage them. He says, do not be afraid. The Lord has come down to test you, to test us, to see if the fear of the Lord would be in us. And so that's such an interesting phrase. Don't be afraid. He is coming to test us to see if we have the fear of the Lord. And so basically this idea, uh, perfect love casts out all fear, but also the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And so we have to hold these two things in tension and balance. And it makes sense in the spirit, in the kingdom, but for sometimes uh, when we're hearing these two opposite ideas, it, 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 it's a struggle. God does not want us to fear anything uh, except for himself to have the fear of the Lord, but he doesn't want us to remain at the fear of the Lord. He wants us to learn how to have awe and humility and wonder and love for him uh, so that we can experience that perfect love, which would cast out all fear. And so uh, these Jews, they did not pass the test because they actually believed a lie. They said, no man can hear the voice of God and live. And yet they were talking with a man who was still living after talking face to face with God. That was Moses. And so they were believing a lie. And so they actually, in that moment of testing, where God came down to test them to see if the fear of the Lord would be in them, they actually chose uh, religion over relationship. 
Why? They wanted an intermediary uh, <clears throat> in their relationship with God. Rather than they go and connect and encounter God directly, they said, Moses, you go do that for us, and we will just worship God from a distance, from separation. And what was initiated after that? It was the tabernacle system with priests. And only one tribe out of the 12 had the privilege of being priests, and that were the Levites. And the Levites had the priestly garments. This was Aaron as the high priest and his sons. They would take the offering at the altar, an unblemished sacrifice. And uh, they were the ones that got to sacrifice, do the blood, sprinkling of the blood, go to the laver, cleanse the laver. They had the priestly garments. They had the crown that says, holy to the Lord. They were the only ones as priests to go into the tabernacle, the holy place, and minister at the lampstand. Only the priests were allowed to eat the, the bread at the table of showbread and to minister at the altar of incense. And then only the high priest, Aaron, once a year on the Day of Atonement was allowed to go through the veil uh, to minister before the Lord at the Ark of the Covenant. And so... <clears throat> What was it like for non-priests, non-Levites to worship God? The closest that they could come was enter the gate and present an animal sacrifice at the altar. And that was it. The priest would take care of everything else. And that was, for generations, their form of worship to the Lord. That's as close as they got to God. And uh, that carried on even till the day of Jesus when he's talking to the Samaritan woman where only the priests were allowed into the temple. And so uh, <clears throat> he is ushering, he was ushering a new time, a new day when we're no longer going to have this separation, but we're going to learn because we're all priests, first priest or two, or the royal priesthood, those who are in Christ, they become uh, clothed and ordained with the priestly garments and crowned with that crown that says holy to the Lord that enables them, uh, Hebrew says, to enter boldly into the throne room of grace. And so we have access into the tabernacle, but into the heavenly tabernacle. because so there's no more earthly temple or tabernacle anymore. There's a heavenly tabernacle that the Lord is inviting his children to enter in in order to truly worship God, to worship him in the realm of the spirit. Why? Because God is spirit and uh, to worship in truth, that not at a copy, not at a shadow, but at the true tabernacle. And uh, this is illustrated in the the uh, the difference between what Moses experienced and what the Jews experienced, the rest of the Jews. The, the Jews, they experienced worship at the tabernacle, even just outside the tabernacle, and they just brought their offering, and then priests would take care of the rest, and that was their form of worship. But what was it for Moses? Moses went to the top of the mountain and encountered God 40 days, 40 nights, and uh, was so filled with his presence and his glory, he didn't even need to eat or drink. Uh, he got to see his goodness, the Lord's goodness, pass before him in the cleft of the rock. He got to encounter him and be with him in the tent of meeting. Uh, he went up the mountain and took the 70 elders with him, and the Lord prepared a banquet for them, and the ground turned into lapis lazuli, which is a gemstone that was found in Revelation. It's in the, in the throne room. It's, it's, so what happened is that even though Moses was, were, it was in physical locations on the temple, uh, I'm sorry, on the mountaintop, uh, in the tent of meeting, uh, in the cleft of the rock, each of those places uh, were transformed into the realm of the spirit. Either he was transported or the realm of the spirit manifest wherever he was so that he could encounter the, the father face to face. And the Bible says he talked with God face to face as a man talks with his friend. And so this is what the Father desires, and what Jesus was ushering in this new day, this new time, when the Father desires worshipers who will begin to learn how to enter into the realm of the Spirit so that their worship is not from here, earth to heaven, but it is face to face in this realm of the Spirit. And this is a great mystery. <laughs> this is Proverbs 25, too, that uh, 
It's the glory of God to conceal, to be mysterious, and it's the glory of kings to search out these hidden things, these mysteries. And uh, these mysteries are being revealed in this day and time, and this is not about uh, mysticism or special knowledge or anything like that, but it is a divine invitation that the Lord is releasing this revelation of teaching the church that it's no longer about worship as a, at a physical location, but it's learning how, no matter where we are on earth, to enter into the realm of the Spirit to encounter Him. And the shift in thinking, the shift in belief system, the, the shift in revelation and experience is going to radically transform uh, the church and uh, people's understanding of Christianity and God, because God will not be some distant, fearful being, but he will be the father, the best dad in the whole world that uh, we experience that perfect love, and there's no separation. There's union with him in this realm of the Spirit. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 6, 17, those who are enjoined together with Christ are one Spirit together, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are now the tabernacle. He's made his dwelling in our hearts, and he dwells within us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so, uh, it's just going to require this shift of thinking, this repentance, changing the way that we think, and then learning how to practice entering into the realm of the Spirit. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in, because Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more I want to say to you, much more than you can now bear, much more than you can handle. Uh, but when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so, this learning, this invitation of how to enter into the realm of the Spirit is meant to be done through the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. He's our counselor. He's our comforter because, comforter because uh, it takes us out of our comfort zone of, for most of us who have experienced or been in the church, we understand worship a certain way. When we hear the word worship, certain things come to mind, and we think, this is our practice of worship. But Jesus actually ushered us in to worship in a different way. And this is the way the Father desires, to worship in the realm of the Spirit and in truth. And a lot of believers, they think this will only happen after we die and we go to heaven. And that may be true for a lot of people, but according to our faith, may it be so. The reality is the Scripture says we have already died. Uh, we have been crucified with Christ, Paul says in Galatians, and we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And so uh, G. Paul also says that when we uh, were baptized, we were buried with Christ in baptism. And when we came out of the waters, we were resurrected with Christ. And so we've already uh, died in him, with him. And now we're resurrected with him and we're actually seated with him in heavenly places. And so how is this possible? Uh, it's because the kingdom is outside of time. And so uh, in one sense, we are in two places at the same time. But we're here on earth, but we're also with him in the spirit, realm of the spirit. And it's learning how to tap into that kingdom reality of the spirit and allow that reality to become the reality on earth. And this is the Lord's prayer that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, we are in the heavenly tabernacle. We are in the spiritual tabernacle, worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. And he wants that manifestation here on earth. And it just requires this childlike faith to believe and to trust and to be led by the Spirit. Romans 8, 14, those who are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. And so uh, <clears throat> ask the Lord about this. Ask, read John 4, read that story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what did Jesus mean when he said, the Father desires worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth? And let him guide you and teach you, and begin to talk to people that you trust and respect uh, about what this means, and uh, have him 
reveal, the Holy Spirit reveal uh, different parts of scripture uh, that points to this idea. And another uh, encouragement is to read the book of Hebrews, which really goes into this idea of the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle versus the heavenly tabernacle. And this is where we are meant to dwell. This is where Christ is. He's our great high priest, and he lives, always lives to make intercession for us. And where does he do that? In the heavenly tabernacle. And if we are in Christ, that means we're there too. And we need to learn how to connect with that reality so that we can worship him in the way that he desires. And so bless you to begin being taught by him in all things, Isaiah 54, 13, that the Lord himself will teach you and great will be your peace. And begin practicing with the Holy Spirit. God, uh, I don't want to just worship you from this location, from this building, from this prayer room, from this closet, from wherever I am, but I want to learn how to enter into the spirit realm that I can begin to minister to you, to encounter you face to face, just like Moses did, even though he was in physical locations on earth, he learned how to be transported into the realm of the spirit. And, uh, Peter experienced this. Uh, Paul, he said he knew a man who was taken up to the third heaven. John the Beloved experienced this in Revelation, that he uh, <clears throat> was taken up and he saw Jesus face to face in the heavenly realms. And Jesus even laid his hands on him and says, come up higher. I, need, I want to show you more, even greater things. And he got to see the throne room where the father was uh, sitting on the throne and um, the four living creatures were there, the 24 elders and the heavenly hosts. And this is where we're meant to worship the Father. And we can only get there through the Son. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. So let the Holy Spirit guide us to the Son. No one can say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus will take us to the Father. And there we have communion with him. And we learn how he desires to be worshipped in the realm of the Spirit, in perfect fellowship and peace with his Trinity, with his being, the Spirit, his Son, as well as himself. And so uh, this is this revolution that's coming, this radical reformation in the church's concept of worship, that it's not just going to be about a time of singing, and singing is great, and instruments and music is wonderful, but it's going to be learning how to uh, dwell in the heavenly tabernacle and experience the goodness, the uh, marvel, the wonder, the awe, the sheer glory of the heavenly realms and the heavenly tabernacle, and to hear his voice, to see his face, and to be able to communicate with him face to face. That is true worship, is this union of two. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one. But Paul quotes that in Ephesians and said, I'm not talking about man and woman. I'm talking about Jesus and the church, his bride. And so it's a great mystery. And this is that mystery that's being unfolded, unpacked, revealed to his children. If we are hungering for it, if we are pursuing, if we are desiring for this mystery, uh, that if we just call to him, Jeremiah 33, 3, he will answer us and teach us, guide us, invite us in and uh, tell us great and unsearchable things we did not know. So bless you in this. I look forward to uh, the Lord releasing this more and more, more believers having this hunger to uh, not just be satisfied with the old forms of worship, worshiping in a temple, worshiping in a tabernacle, worshiping on a mountain, uh, to uh, hearing great testimonies of people learning how to enter into the spirit realm and worshiping from that place. And we're seeing that more and more all throughout the world and bless you to experience that as well.